reason is, oh, I don't, I'm sick, I got a problem, uh, you know, my back's hurting, my head's hurting, my hips hurting, whatever. That's a reason. But excuses and reasons are two different things. Amen. Amen. I'll take a reason any day. I would like excuses. Amen. Keep me seated. All right. <clears throat> Here we go. It's time to see my offering. Remember, uh, the little man in the back, the little brass man in the back is here. You can drop it off on the way in, or you can drop it off on the way out. If you have already dropped it out, put your hand up. If you haven't, put it in your hand and hold it up. Let's say it together. I lift my offering to you, that it please you, O Lord. This is my seed, but at least my hand that will never leave my life, you will multiply, except my seed, O Lord. Let me tell you something. When you, when you, let go here on earth. God lets go in heaven. Amen. Matter of fact, when you let go of what you can see, God lets go of what you can't see. It's very, very, very powerful. We're going to trust God with that. All right, God. Praise the Lord, saints. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Does uh, anybody have an outspoken request this morning? Uplifted hands, special needs, lost loved ones. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house, Lord God. Father, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ear is open unto their prayer. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity of prayer this morning. We just ask that you administer mightily into each and every request, Lord God. Show yourself strong on behalf of each and everyone here. Supply the need according to your riches and glory that testimony would be given, Father. And Father, we thank you for everything that's said and done. Now be with us in the remainder of this service this day, Lord. Touch us, prepare our hearts to receive the message and anoint the pastor as he delivers. And we'll thank you for everything and give testimony that we were in your presence this day. Christ Jesus' name, the church said. Let's all stand by God. Go a little melody here, we're going to do it.
Isn't God so, so amazing? I can't, I, sometimes I think, you know, it just, it just, it just treats me special like I was an only child. You ever feel that way? Always. Always. You should feel that way always because he treats us all as a very powerful child in his heart and in his life. God's got so much in store before you turn. You already sit down, but I'm going to do, do you good today. Just stay down. And I'm just going to read this to you, the book of Philemon. Okay? Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dear and beloved, and fellow laborer. To our beloved Ophelia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, to the to the church in the house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward his saints, and that the communication of faith may become effectual by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ. We have a great joy and consolation in our love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee. Wherefore, there must be born in Christ to to enjoy thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, you being now such a one as Paul the aged and now also prisoner of Jesus Christ, I beseech you for my son Elizabeth, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Think about this. Whom I have begotten in my whom I have begotten in my bonds. In other words, he didn't even know him until he got in prison, and then this guy gets in prison, this is where it all falls. It all goes down in prison. Amen. Now, here a lot of people tell me all the time, you just got a bunch of captured audience, and they're not going to do anything. They're not going to change when they get asked to be different. Well, I beg to differ. You're kind of right, because there is some people, it is a captured audience, and as soon as they get out, they go right back to the same old thing. But that's not an always. That's a sometimes. Because there's a, there's a lot of people that make a, make a very positive difference. In the SHARP program, we're about an 80% success rate. That's great. That is great, but there have been hundreds of guys passed through there. Eighty percent success rate is amazing. Uh, whom I would have retained with me, uh, but that I said that he might have ministered me into the bonds of the gospel, but without thy mind would I do nothing that thy benefit should not be as word of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he departed for a season, but thou shouldst receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but a bubble servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, because of how much more to me, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou count me as thy partner, and receive him unto myself, and if he's wronged thee, and all of thee thou, I'll put that on mine account. Paul has written, I, Paul, has written in my own hand, I will repay it, how bad, do not say to thee, how thou owes him be even thy own self besides. So let's just go ahead and pray. Father, I love you, Lord. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I know, God, that you are alive and well on your own throne. I know, God, that there are so many things in this world that we have to contend with. And there are so many people, so many places, and so many things that bring harm to us. And we have to fight this good fight every day. And as time goes by, it seems to be getting greater and greater and greater. The adversity is getting greater, which tells me that your coming is so close. I ask you right now, Lord, to minister in a very powerful way. We thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, we love you. And we praise your name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Uh, the owner of a drugstore walks in to find a guy leaning heavily against the wall. The owner asked the clerk, what's with the guy over there by the wall? The clerk replies, but he came in here this morning to get something for his cough. I couldn't find the cough syrup, so I gave him an entire bottle of laxatives. The owner screams, you're crazy. You can't treat a cough with a bottle of laxatives. The clerk comes and replies, of course you can. Look at him. He's afraid to cough. He's afraid to even move. <laughs> Amen. I, I saw this and I thought this was so awesome. But for us, the older people, look. I don't know how to use TikTok, but I can write in cursive. I can do long division. I can tell time on clocks with hands. So there's that. <laughs> you do. You do. Yeah. <laughs> tell. Yeah. Yeah. 
and I T. Intelligent. <laughs> that is so good. Artificial that's intelligence. That's the, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Amen. Oh yeah. That thing's coming up now. That's scary. Artificial intelligence. Yes. I may remember a movie years ago called Colossus. Colossus. Colossus was a movie when I was a child. So it way back. Woo. Black black TVs were popular. Woo. And Colossus was a, a computer that actually was artificial intelligence. But this was way back in the 60s. And it told them, and the movie started out how good it was for everybody and how it did such good things. It didn't know it was prophetic. But this Colossus computer decided that it was going to take care of this, and it took over everything. And it became a horror movie, you know, or suspense movie. Suspense movie. And I think about Colossus, I've thought about it over the years, and now with this artificial intelligence coming, because how you program it is going to be what, what vent it goes to. So, so we got to be careful with this artificial intelligence and stick with God's intelligence. Okay? God gave you a mind for a reason. Amen. All right? So, so let's go ahead and go here. Now, sure. that's right. That's so let's right. go ahead and do this. Go little, there we go. Here we go. <clears throat> We're talking about lessons from grace. And this is the last one. Next one's going to be excuses. It's not about excuses for staying out of church. It's about excuses for not working for the Lord. There's a difference. Excuse for staying out of church. Again, there's a difference in a reason and an excuse. And there's a lot of good reasons, and God sees it, and God knows that. And, and we thank God for Facebook, and we thank God for YouTube, for the ones that uh, have reasons. But at the same time, don't let anything in my life, God, become an excuse for keeping me out of your house, because it's in here is where we learn. And here we have fellowship that you don't have anywhere else. So, we're talking about, first off, just two or three slides, then we're going straight to it. A God, God's love is agape love, all right? Agape love is an act of determination of your will. Uh, and it's a determination of will to benefit somebody else without regard for your own benefit. And then it's the power that is behind grace. <clears throat> Our challenge, I love this, but grace has been saved through faith. Not of ourselves, it is a gift of God. Our challenge is to accept grace by faith, but also to pass it on by our works. Okay, our attitude and our actions. And then here it is, this is it. Love that. See those bad things there? Love covers a multitude of sin. Above all, have a fervent, unfailing love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. It overlooks unkindness and unselfish, unselfishly seeks for the best in others. It's really crazy, and I know God's in this today, because this morning, the program I normally watch was not on. And so I flipped through the channels, and I happened to come across where I said, Charles Stanley's coming up next. But there was a mass. And so I decided, well, just so I won't miss Charles Stanley, I'll put it on that mass. And when I put it on the mass, this is what it's talking about. The Catholic priest was talking about it. His readers were talking about this. This is already written. This was done last night, finished up last night. I had no idea what that Catholic priest was going to say or what Charles Stanley was going to say. But they were running right down the line with this. So, again, God never said that we had to approve of or participate with uh, what other people do, but we are expected to always show a God thing. Or God's love. The book of Philemon. The book of Philemon, I think it's become the book of Onesimus, but you know, I didn't choose the name of it. But that is pure agape exemplified. Onesimus, he was a runaway slave, and as he's running away, God chases him down, and this is where some good things come. Grace is going to chase you down. It's the first lesson. Grace chases you down. It finds you where you are. You don't have to be in church to find grace. You can be anywhere. I found him in a bar. I found him in clubs. I found him all over the place where I was at. God was always there tugging at my heart. So this one was a slave. No, he was a slave. His status was he was socially with, uh, without status, criminally without excuse, and personally without hope they could... Kill him right on sight if they want to for what he had done. So his life had stopped him. Now he stopped. Now that's where we stopped last week. 
So let's go a little bit further here. Now, not only would grace chase you, Paul's letter to Philemon, it says, For love's sake, I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul the age, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul is now going to talk to Philemon on behalf <coughs> of Onesimus. Paul, who is probably the greatest example in the New Testament of grace because he was one of the greatest examples of needing grace, God gave him grace because of stuff he had done. He caused families to be separated, jobs to be taken away, people to be killed, pulled apart by lions, uh, uh, speared, gladiators were taken out. There's all kinds of things fed to the lions. Paul needed grace very badly. And once Paul received that grace, it took him a while. It took him a decade. But now he's out and he is showing that grace. Now he is confronting Philemon. Let's just read this. Wherefore thou might be much bold in Christ to enjoy thee, that which you can feed it, yet for love's sake, y'all say love's sake. Love's sake. It's the agape. I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I was seized before my son on this one. Wait a minute. This is the slave that's run away. Now he's Paul's son, whom I have begotten in my bones. Wow. Wow. So, grace will confront you. It deals differently with the problem than how we deal with the problem. Because the way the problem should have been handled was he would have had either Onesimus killed in Rome where he was at, or Onesimus would have been brought back and he could have killed Onesimus or uh, cut off his hands, and or he could have uh, uh, sold him, which may not have killed him. So let us sit here. If we actually got charged with everything we were guilty of, I'll leave it there. Those guys at Lead Five, those guys at Pitt, those guys at Buffer go, man, you, you have no idea. No. And I go, well, I'm always a preacher. And I also tell them a lot of things, a lot of things that people are caught and doing and doing things from being punished for. A lot of us just weren't caught. Amen? Yeah. That's it. So now, first off, how I many here's perfect? Raise your hand. Again. <laughs> how I many is perfect? I mean, you don't make any mistakes. You don't ever get in trouble. Raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> All right. How I many here need grace every day? All right, we need grace every day. So now, here's, here it is. Grace will confront you with this regular with the problem. Matter of fact, it removes your excuses and it recalls you to take responsibility. So now, we just read it. He told Philemon, he said, take him back. I need you to take him back. And then in verse 10, for on this one, he says, which in time past unto thee was unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, do not sin again there, thou, therefore receive him, that is my own bounds. That shows his love that he had for this man. So now, grace is confronting the problem, not running from it, not saying, and this much you need to get up and run because if Lehman ever catches you, you've had it. I learned in my last few years, if I find somebody trying to hold something over my head, I'm going to deal with it. Just deal with it. Because I don't want to hold something over my head. Just deal with it, get it over with. The same way, this is the way Paul saw it with the listeners. She says, go ahead and deal with it, because if you don't, you've got a death warrant. So we're going to deal with it, but let's deal with it God's way. So, grace will confront you, it deals directly with the problem. Let's go a little bit deeper here. Grace means that a lot of your mistakes now serve a purpose, instead of serving shame. Think about that, that is so powerful. Grace means 
I'm going to say it again. Grace means that all of your mistakes now serve a purpose instead of serving change. It's amazing how when God gets a hold of you, how things can turn around, how God can use you in a very special, special, special way. Remember, we're talking about grace will confront you. It deals directly with the problem. Look, as you think about something, I tell these guys this, I'll be telling this tomorrow. At both places that I go to. Here it is. Grace does not help you escape your past. Let me stop that sink here. Grace does not help you escape your past. It helps you face it and deal with it. Don't escape it, but face it, deal with it, and rise above it. So, number one, grace will confront you. But now that grace confronts you, <coughs> look at this, His grace refines us, His grace helps us become our best selves. Grace will change you. Wow. I remember how I used to be. And I can tell you're a great husband, you're a great provider, you're a great dad. And I remember back in the day before DC was born, I remember going out and partying and bringing my first wife with me and, and we'd get arguing and I wouldn't keep on going out and partying and she didn't. And I remember taking her to the house. I didn't sure didn't know it because she had a key to the house and putting her out in the dark and saying, just leave me alone. And I'd drive off and go party some more with my friends. I don't even dare think about doing that this day and time. I go in the house and wife every time she goes in to make sure there's nobody in there and everything's okay. But grace got a hold of me. Grace changed me. Very powerfully changed me. It did something for me that nobody else could do. And I thank God for His powerful, powerful grace. So, it will change you. It's not going to leave you as you are. Once God gets a hold of you, something special is going to happen. First, it happened to Philemon, where it says uh, in verse 1, uh, Paul, the President of Christ, said Timothy, our brother, and to Philemon, our dearly beloved and fellow laborer. Now remember now, we're talking about Philemon now. In verse 7, for we have great joy and consolation in our love, because the bowels of the saints were refreshed by thee, my brother. When Paul found Philemon, he was unsaved. Paul evangelized him, Paul worked with him, he discipled him, and he served with Paul. And when Paul left, he left Philemon in charge of that church. So Philemon can't forget that he needs grace too. When I go in and I I know what kind of sales. I know where certain sales what people are charged with. I don't ever ask them what they're charged with. But over here, this side, I know, I know these guys over here, they've done certain things. These guys over here, they've done certain things. They ain't got to tell me that's what those sales are for. And so when I go in, I don't decide I'm not going in that sale because I know what they're charged with. I'm not going in that sale because I know what they're charged with. I go in all of them. And when I go in all of them, I start talking to the people. All I can always remember is this. When it said they need grace, I keep saying to myself, I need grace too. How I many here doesn't need grace? We all do. How I many ever how I many here come up short from time to time? Amen. So now that's, that that was Philemon. God changed Philemon. Now it's gonna be listens. <laughs> Which at time past so profitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Matter of fact, and this was means profitable. At one time, Onesimus was unsaved. Again, the same, look at the same, the same exact stuff. He was evangelized and discipled by Paul, and he served with Paul. Here it is, the owner and the slave, both of the boss and the worker, all of them. They all Works with Paul. Paul was the one that helped change their life. That God, God used him to help change their life. It's amazing how although they had two entirely different mindsets and they had two entirely different jobs, 
They both had the same thing happen to them. You see, grace is not going to leave you like you are. So grace will change you. But not only will grace change you, I love this, for this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. I love that. Verse 15. Ready? Grace will challenge you. I'm getting close to the end there. Grace challenges you to be all you can be. First, there's that restoration. Verse 12. Who might sin again, the devil will deceive him, that is, my own violence. I'm sending them this one's back to make things right. I'm not sending them back for just anything. I'm sending them back to make things right. And when he comes back, I want you to accept him. Resolution 12, 20, and 21. 12, do I sin again? I went and received my own vows. And 28, brother, let me have, let me have joy of thee in the Lord, refresh my bowels in the Lord, having confidence in obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou will also do more than I say. Take him back as a brother. I'm sending him back to you, not to be beat, not to be sold, not to be killed. I'm sending him back to you as a fellow laborer in Christ, and I need you to accept him as such. 16, not as a servant, but above a servant, a brother, beloved, especially to me. But now how much more to thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord? If thou count me therefore as a partner, receive him as myself. In other words, you receive him like you received me. And then Paul says, you know what, if he owes you anything, which he did. If he owes you anything, I'll take care of it. I'll pay it. Now, you would think this is... Maybe the end of the story, he takes him back, they live happily ever after, they kiss him, they come. No. This is just the beginning of the story. We've seen a lot of this. Grace will keep on challenging. See, same distance, what you can be, get ready. Forty-four years later, Missus wrote to Bishop of Ephesus. His name was Onesimus. The Catholic Church celebrates February 16th every year to Saint Onesimus. Onesimus. After he come back, and believe and accept with him, and this was began to work for the Lord. Not only did he begin to work for the Lord, he got so good at it and so powerful that when Timothy passed on as the Bishop of Ephesus, Anismus took over. So Anismus, who was a former slave, whose life was on the line there, became a mission. I love what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, love bears all things and believes all things. And it doesn't stop there. He's preaching the gospel. And as he's preaching the gospel, they capture him. And for 18 days, they tortured him. They clubbed his legs, his thighs. They broke his legs, they broke his thighs. He still looked the can. And then finally, after they did all of that, they stoned him to death. The runaway slave became one of the greatest bishops of his time. And he was so good at it. They were just going to stand him. And they tried to take him down. And on the outside, they did. But on the inside, no, any God's eyes, they never did. 
Voilà. Not a symbol. I can take what we consider nobody and make them somebody. That's why I like this little saying. I'm just one beggar. Tell another beggar. Worth I'm rich. If I met, I was in the hospital. Somebody's dad was dying. And their dad would never, would never accept Jesus. And the doctor said their dad was going to die. And they asked me, said, what are we going to do? Can you please talk to him? I said, I've tried to talk to him. He doesn't want to hear me. I said, then Lord, get, Lord, put something in my mind. I said, I think I got it. And so I went upstairs in intensive care. And I talked to this man. And I said, you remember talking to you about salvation? He said, yep, I want to hear it. I said, well, I just want to tell you something. I'm going to leave you something. I'm just going to take you something. Just, just take you something. I said, all right. I said, number one, you know you're dying. He said, yes. And I said, you know when you die, if you're not ready, or you are ready, the two choices. He said, yep. So I'm ready. And I said, here's what the Lord told me to do. I said, well, I'm going to leave you, I'm going to leave you with something. If you ever should decide to give your heart to God, it's not that hard. You just tell somebody, tell God, tell somebody you need somebody to help you. Tell God, I'm sorry for the life I live. And I need you to forgive me for my sin and bring me to life. Because I believe you died for me. And you're sitting there, Father, right hand. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. The man died that night. And then burned. I went to the hospital. And his son came out and grabbed me. He started crying on my shoulder. He said, I, said, I was so sorry. He said, no, 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 this is not, I'm not crying for sadness. I'm crying for joy. I said, joy? He said, yeah, he said, before my daddy died, he looked at me and said, can you carry me outside of the room? He said, can you talk to me for a minute? He said, yes, sir. He said, can you help me pray? He said, I need that. So he said, okay, you, well, how are you going to do it? He said, I want to tell God that I'm sorry for all of them. Everything I told him, that see him there. Everything I told him, he told his son, his son told it back to him. He died a little while later, but he died first. It's so powerful. Very, very, very powerful. First Corinthians, the 13th verse. No man, no, 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 no one has greater love than this, that someone should surrender his soul in behalf of his friends. A lot of people think it's all got to do with being a martyr. It doesn't mean necessarily being a martyr. It means you put aside your needs and your wants for somebody else's as a God man again. Although it does mean your life, but it also means not just your life, but other things. So, Grace the challenge is us. 1 Corinthians 13. Verse 13. Let's just do this one more time. Love beareth all things. It means to put a roof over your head to cover the multitude of sins. It believes all things. It means to have faith. Not to be gullible, but to have faith in being. It means to hope, some, hope all things, uh, to expect, to confide, sees the bright side of things, and endures all things, stay under, perseveres like a stout hearted soldier. Now, I'm going to put a statement up here. Then the first time I read this, it slapped me in the mouth. You ready? Calvary 
the greatest show of agape, the greatest show of grace. He really slapped me in the mouth because I was mad at somebody. Tell my real kids. Takes away all of our rights to avenge or hold a group. One more time. Agape, Calvary, takes away all of our rights to avenge ourselves or to hold good. When you think of what Jesus did on that cross, forgiving us, and I remember somebody said he would forgive you if you were the one that nailed the nails in his hands, but I... I finally corrected that. Because the truth is, I was the one that held his hands. I was the one that nailed his feet. I was the one that pierced his soul. And not only me, but everybody in here. Next time you're tempted, To let it rip. Think about that. This week's challenge get ready. Instead of being led by, get ready, your emotions, your pride. And you're hurt. Sometimes things that happen to us, we get all emotional. And when we're getting all emotional, we say things and do things later and we think about it and go, man, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. I wish I hadn't have done that. Or maybe our pride, well, they've done that to me. How can I walk away if they've done that to me? Or just our hurt. You know, uh, you ever talk to somebody and they talk different, they act different? And later on you talk about it and it wasn't them talking, but it was their hurts that talking. Sometimes it's physical pain, sometimes it's emotional pain, sometimes it's spiritual pain. This week, instead of being led by your emotions, your pride, your hurt, remember that the heart is deceitful above all things. Jeremiah said that. So my heart is the sequel of all things. That's where my emotions, my pride, and my hurt reside. This week, and Granny, come over here and bless something, bro. Be led by His Word. Be led by His Spirit. Be led by grace. This doesn't mean not to defend yourself. This doesn't mean not to take care of business in certain areas. I'm talking when it comes to your brothers and sisters and people that you're working with, and you just want to get back at them. No. Thank God to it. God's better at it than you are. Watch your life change this week drastically. I can always tell when they're being led by their emotions, pride, and hurt. Several reasons, several things. There's one thing that always really gets me is when they go, I'm just going to do it because the Bible says an eye for an eye. And then I get a chance to bust the bubble. And I go, you are absolutely correct. Eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. That's old just Jesus said, I say to you, don't be that way. No eye for an eye. Don't do that. Show them grace.
over the years, I can sit back and I can look and I can think about the times that something happened to me and I struck back. I'm not talking about, it's not because of my house tonight at 4 o'clock in the morning. He's not there looking for prayer, but he's going to give me anything. I'm not talking about that. It's not people in the work, people in the family, people in church. And I remember two things. One, when I struck back. And one, when I struck with grace. One struck with my emotions, cried and hurt, blown with grace. And every time I think about when I struck with emotions, pride, and hurt, I hurt now. When I think about when I struck back with the word, his spirit and grace, I feel relief. And I feel thankful. Philippian had no idea, although he had his own church in his home and he was doing so much good for Paul, he had no idea that all this was going to take place. And this was it. No, Paul didn't know. And this was on the run, but he could not run God. Kissing every Paul. Stuck beside him. Get saved. He looked at death, nice looking at life. And because of the way Philemon treated him, not with emotions, not with pride, not with hurt, but by his word, his spirit, his grace, and this became one of the greatest preachers of his time. They came to Bishop Ephesus. Wow. Very, very, very powerful. Today, right now, every head bowed, every eye closed. something on anger on Tuesday nights here at the church. So I was reading when I was going to college, I was reading one of my psych books, one of the courses. And so I called my psych books and my psych courses had always had different crises and linked to a lot of crises. And it's just always in that direction. Once I read, I'm just going to use Greenville as an example. If people could learn to quit responding with bush and pride and hurt and start responding with the word spirit and grace and learn to let things go, just let them go. Wow. It's amazing. What would happen? Matter of fact, it said that the heart centers would empty out by fifty percent. Wow! Wow! It's powerful. The heart centers and the mental institutions. But it'd be out by 50%. If people could learn to quit harboring everything, keeping it inside, want to just get out. Did I see my army this morning? It was intentional. All the part of this was especially intentional for this morning. I'm read the last three. Friday's was, mighty army, if you could see how big the blessing was on the other side of this battle, 
So on the other side of this battle will make sense. Keep on pressing. Saturday, Mighty Army. New blessings are often disguised as painful endings. Positive changes will always follow difficult challenges. And to that, Mighty Army, forgive yourself and let the hurt go. How you do all that? Be led by your emotions, your pride, your hurt. Be led by God's word, His Spirit, His grace. Everybody stand. Every head bow, every eye close. It's amazing. The hope. Anismus, who had no hope, the hope he got just by being beside Paul. So Paul was a part of Anismus' change. He's part of the catalyst. But Philemon was the one that helped keep. Well, he was the one who had him killed, had him sold, had his hands cut off, had his feet cut off, had him tortured till he died. But Paul, the one at one time who knew no grace, received grace and gave it on further. Philemon's the key here. Because if he hadn't responded with grace, if he'd been led by his emotions, his pride, his hurt, there would never have been a saint on this one's day. There'd never be a bishop on this one's. Ephesus would never even know his name. Because of the way Philemon responded. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever thought about how you may be a Philemon for something? How you may be the one that is the key to somebody else's growth and somebody else's receiving God. It's amazing. Amazing. Amazing how we see these things. Now remember, Philemon comes from Philea, which is brotherly love. And this was means to be profitable. You can hold the key. Think about it. You could be the one on the end of this campus. <laughs> if you're here today, and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, or you know Him, but you're not as close to Him as you'd like to be, with nobody looking around, all hands bowed, all eyes closed, with your hand, I, I'm not as close as I need to be, bless me, Lord, bless me, bless me. Maybe you're here today, and it just occurred to you, there are certain areas in your life that you're being led by your emotions, your pride, your hurt. And that's why it's causing more hurt and no resolution. Instead of being led by his word, his spirit, his grace.
Today I challenge you. Change the way you see things. Change your perspective. Ask God to let you be a fool. And watch what happens in your life. Let's pray together. Father, I love you. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace, for your mercy, because I need it every day. God, help me not just be a vessel to receive your grace and mercy, but help me be a channel that your grace and mercy can flow through and make a difference in people's lives. And I thank you for it in the name of Jesus. That we say the Lord's Prayer, we may ask Brother Blake his business in prayer. Read the wrongs here. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. Father God, it is a pleasure and honor to be able to stand before you this day, Lord, and thank you for the mercy and grace that you pour out upon us and for all the goodness that you do for us and our families, Lord. Father, we can say thank you for that. Father, we ask you to let us take the words from the today into our hearts and our minds, be meditated upon it, Father, and be better servants for you. Go with us now, Lord, and bring us back up the next appointed time. And to all this, I'll ask in your name, Son, Jesus Christ. And I do say amen and amen. Amen.